When I ask retired coaches what they wish they knew when they started coaching, the most common response I get is this, psychology, or I wish I knew more about psychology, or I wish I majored in sports psychology. Experienced coaches know that mental factors such as concentration, confidence, and motivation are just as important or sometimes even more important than physical factors. The famous Yankees catcher Yogi Berra said that baseball is 90% mental, the other half is physical. Now his wit may be more impressive than his arithmetic skills, but his point is clear. The mental side of sport performance is important. What's great about mental skills is that, like physical skills, they can be practiced and learned. An athlete can get better at focusing. An athlete can learn to influence his or her motivation and confidence. And an athlete's motivation and confidence can be influenced by others. To be effective, leaders need to understand how to influence people to do what they need to do, when they need to do it, in the way it needs to be done to achieve achieve some objective. For sport coaches, the objective is to enhance the performance of an individual or a group of individuals, regardless of whether the stated objective of the coach and athlete is to outscore the opponent or to help the athlete maximize his or her potential. This lecture will focus on what coaches can do to influence the mental states of athletes throughout training sessions and competitions. Specifically, we will discuss three ways in which coaches can increase the likelihood that their players will be in the right frame of mind to perform well in practices and competitions. These are three things that are within the coach's control. And coaches, just like athletes, tend to perform better when they focus on what they can control, like their own attitudes and behaviors, and figure out how not to dwell on things beyond their control, like the weather or calls made by officials. So let's start with the coach's objective, to maximize the performance of his or her athletes. While there are all sorts of variables that have been shown to correlate with sport performance, these variables are so intercorrelated that it is statistically nonsensical for sports psychology researchers to use them all in a regression model because a properly specified regression model includes all of the important predictor variables, i.e. those that explain a large percentage of the variance, and none of the unimportant predictor variables, i.e. those variables that explain very little variance or are strongly correlated with one or more important variables. And for sports psychology practitioners and coaches, trying to make sense of how all these variables combine to influence sports psychology is mind-numbing. And any sort of flowchart ends up looking like a Jackson Pollock painting. Having 20 variables just isn't very helpful if we're trying to find actionable intelligence to help our athletes perform better. I like to use the big three factors because they are all positively correlated with sport performance. These three big factors, focus, motivation, and confidence, are what I will call the athlete's mindset. To create the conditions in which an athlete can do their best, the coach needs to do what he or she can do to influence the athlete's mindset. Now when many coaches think of using sports psychology, they tend to imagine something mysterious and they will look near and far for the mystical when the obvious is right in front of their faces. The foundation of proper focus, motivation, and confidence is really not mysterious at all. In fact, it is so obvious that we sometimes forget how important it is. And that may be why we forget to talk about it when we consider an athlete's mindset. The foundation of focus, motivation, and confidence is nothing more than a person's general health and well-being. Think about it. If you haven't eaten properly, or if you are dehydrated, or you haven't slept adequately, or if you have some acute illness like the flu, it is really difficult to concentrate. And if you're not able to concentrate, it becomes difficult to stay motivated because you don't believe that you can succeed. 
i.e. your confidence decreases. It's silly to talk about using tricks and tools to influence an athlete's mindset until we have a strong foundation to build upon, and that foundation is the athlete's general health and well-being. Therefore, if a coach is interested in doing whatever she can to help her team perform well, the coach needs to at least be aware of the health and well-being of the children or adults that she is coaching. And if something is getting in the way of optimal health for one or more of the players, the coach has an opportunity to help her team by figuring out what she can do to rectify the situation. This may mean helping the athletes find adequate food to eat. I've been in this situation coaching soccer in Uganda and coaching tennis in the United States. In situations where getting plenty of food is not a problem, this may mean helping athletes know what to eat and when to eat it. Even in extremely wealthy university athletic programs in the United States, some teams provide pre- and post-game meals that are horrible from a nutrition standpoint. Rather than providing the nutrients that athletes need to replace depleted glycogen stores and promote recovery after rigorous trainings and competition, teams sometimes provide players with fast food that is almost entirely devoid of nutrients. Poor nutrition choices may mean that a coach is not in control of the menu, or it might mean that he isn't knowledgeable about nutrition, or it may, may be that he lacks the discipline to do the little things that need to be done to make big things happen. Great coaches are intentional about details, and nutrition is a critically important detail. But so is sleep. A coach who is serious about increasing the probability that his athletes will be in a mindset that is focused, motivated, and confident will do whatever he can to ensure that his players are getting adequate sleep. That might mean ed educating his players about the importance of taking naps when necessary. Or it may mean empowering the athletes with time management skills that can mitigate risks that other time commitments will interfere with normal sleep schedules. Or it may mean having players stay in hotel rooms with a curfew applied the night before competitions. This last strategy is common practice among major college football teams in the United States. It is also common practice to strongly encourage or sometimes require athletes to get flu shots to decrease the probability that they will fall sick during the season or infect teammates. Coaches can find themselves in any number of different situations, and the way in which they can influence the health and well-being of athletes may take many forms. But the point is this. Coaches who want their players to perform their best need to make sure that the players are in a favorable mindset, first and foremost, by doing whatever they can to increase the likelihood that the athletes will be healthy with adequate food, water, sleep, and that they are provided with the necessary prevention or treatment of illnesses. The second way in which a coach can influence the mindset of their players occurs long before the competition. Great coaches are intentional and deliberate about planning the details of training sessions. For example, legendary UCLA basketball coach John Wooden would spend five times as much time planning a training session as the training session would last. If he were to plan an hour and a half practice, he would spend about seven and a half hours planning. He would start by referencing notes from the corresponding practice from the previous season, looking at what had been done and what possible improvements he had noted after that practice. Then he would incorporate those ideas into his practice plan for the current year, and that practice plan would be described on a series of note cards each of which represented five-minute increments of the practice. Each note card would indicate where each player, each assistant, and each piece of equipment would be located, and what each player and coach would be doing during those five minutes. Once Wooden had completed his practice plan, he would gather his coaches and teach them the plan so that precious time would not be wasted during practices. Now, in addition to increasing the amount of time available for teaching and learning, a well-organized practice has an additional benefit. Things tend to go more smoothly, which allows the athletes to focus on the task at hand. And when athletes are more focused, they tend to perform better. 
and nothing increases confidence in a task more than completing that task successfully over and over again. And at UCLA practices under coach John Wooden, his players would repeat important movements over and over until they were close to perfect. Then they would do it again until it became each athlete's dominant response. This is what psychologists call overlearning. Overlearning allowed Wooden's basketball players to perform these well-practiced fundamentals precisely and quickly, both during practices and under the pressure of competition. It's important to note that having a well-organized and executed practice is only half the battle. Practices also need to be organized in such a way that athletes are challenged. If drills, games, and activities are too easy, athletes have a tendency to get bored. However, if, athlete, if activities are too difficult, athletes may feel frustrated or overwhelmed. So drills, games, and activities should involve an optimal challenge. That is, athletes should be able to achieve success with repetition and effort rather quickly. Just like a weightlifter needs to regularly increase the weight he is lifting or the number of repetitions in a workout in order to challenge his muscles, a coach needs to make sure his players are continually challenged, which keeps them focused, so that they can continue to improve without becoming bored or overwhelmed. Boredom isn't good for motivation, and being overwhelmed certainly isn't good for building confidence, so an optimal challenge is necessary. Practice planning should be a central part of the job of every head coach. The head coach is the leader of the team, so they get to decide how well the practice will be planned and how appropriate the activities will be for the players that they are working with. The feelings of accomplishment and success that result from well-designed practices are tremendously impactful in increasing the confidence of athletes much more impactful than some contrived motivational speech before a game. What we've talked about so far, attending to health and well-being of players, and the importance of careful practice, planning, are things that coaches can do prior to competitions, but there's a third thing that coaches can do during competitions to increase the likelihood that athletes will be or remain in a state of mind that will be conducive to optimal performance. And this has to do with the way coaches respond to mistakes and errors and failures of their athletes. No athlete likes to fail. It doesn't feel good to miss a shot or commit an error or get passed by another runner. Failure or the perception of failure is discouraging. And this word is important, discouraging, meaning courage is taken away or removed. It isn't a good thing for an athlete's performance if their courage is taken away. And that is what failure does. It discourages athletes. Now when an athlete is discouraged by a mistake, they may look toward the coach and look for his or her response. If the coach expresses anger or frustration with his or her body language, facial expressions, or words, she or he will be discouraging that athlete further that is, taking even more of the athlete's courage away. However, if the coach is more mature and understands the importance of courage to sport performance, that coach may be deliberate about reacting with body language and a facial expression and possibly words that are encouraging, i.e. replacing some of the lost courage rather than discouraging, i.e. taking even more courage away. Now I can't tell you this is easy, but I can tell you that it is important. Just like becoming a better basketball player requires practice, becoming a better coach requires practice as well. Some coaches may need to practice suppressing their emotions, perhaps in front of a mirror. Sometimes a coach may need to fake it until they make it. That is, pretend that they are not frustrated or disappointed when they are really frustrated and disappointed. But by doing this, the coach will encourage their athletes and help them stay in a mindset characterized by high levels of confidence, motivation, and focus, even after a mistake. And this will help them perform better. And more importantly, this will strengthen rather than erode the relationship between the coach and the athlete. So there you have it. 
Three things you can do as a coach to increase the probability that your athlete will be in a mindset that is conducive to successful sport performance. It's not magical, just practical and simple. But remember, just because these things are simple does not mean that they are easy. Attending to the health and well-being of your athletes requires effort. Carefully planning practice sessions takes a lot of time and refraining from reacting to mistakes with anger or obvious frustration takes discipline. 